All right, so this is our guest speaker, Mr. Clemson. Mr. Clemson is about to get his PhD in physics, and he has kindly agreed from California uh, to come and speak to you guys about being a physicist. Um, and I think you'll find his, his research background uh, fascinating. We had a ton of questions from fourth hour kids about science, you know, because uh, he's such an expert in that stuff. So please don't hesitate to ask questions, and let's be sure that we're... Uh, respectful and thankful that we have this wonderful guest speaker, Mr. Clemenson, it's all you. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Bells. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm Rob, so I'm a, a theoretical physicist, uh, like Ms. Bales explained. So before I talk to you a little bit about my research and about uh, some other cool things that I wanna mention, um, I'm interested to hear what you guys think physics is, because Miss Bales tells me you're all honor students, you're all you know, very interested in uh, science and you've chosen to take some difficult science classes. So can anyone raise their hand and uh, tell me what do you think of when I say physics or what do you think physics is? Who wants to volunteer? Anybody? Come on, guys, we just did this. No? <laughs> Tayon, what's physics? <laughs> um, uh, basically, the study of electricity. The study of what? Sorry, did you speak up a little bit? Of things. Of things? Things work. Yep. How oh, things how work. things work. Good. Yeah, no, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. So physics is very broad. Um, we study all of the stuff that makes up the universe and how these things that make up the universe interact with each other uh, and how everything works. So physics has a kind of very broad view of trying to understand nature. So an imp important part of that is understanding what everything in the universe is made of. So you know that all the stuff around you right now is if you break it down enough, it's made up of atoms. Um, you know that atoms are made up of even smaller things. There's a nucleus to an atom, and then around the atom, there are electrons spinning around. So protons and neutrons make up the nucleus, and then the electrons spin around that nucleus. Um, so if you look at the protons and the neutrons up close, these are these particles that are kind of at the center of the atom of the, of the nucleus. They're made up of even smaller things called quarks, okay? So um, if you break things down, you can break down molecules. Molecules that you study in chemistry turn into atoms. Atoms turn into protons and neutrons and electrons. And protons and neutrons can break down into even smaller pieces, okay? But can you break down uh, an electron? Is an electron made up of anything? Or are these quarks that make up the protons and neutrons, are they made up of anything? And we don't think they are. The answer is probably no. So these are what we call fundamental particles. They're things that you can't sort of zoom in on them anymore and can't tell anybody what they are made up of. They just are what they are. An electron is an electron, a quark is a quark. You can't split them up into smaller pieces, okay? So, uh, I'm a particle physicist, so these are the things I study. We study these most basic building blocks of what makes up the universe, all the stuff we see around us, okay? And the most basic way you can split things up is into these fundamental particles, these pieces of matter that you can't cut in half, you can't describe them as being made up of anything else, they just are what they are. So it's kind of embarrassing as a particle physicist that your, you know, the whole job is about learning what is the universe made of, what stuff goes into the universe, when we realize that all the stuff you see around you, the stuff that makes up the earth, the sun, uh, all the light you can see in the galaxy, all of that stuff is only 3% of the stuff in the universe, okay? 97% of the stuff in the universe is completely invisible, and we really have no idea what it is, okay? So it's divided into two things that have the same kind of name, but are actually completely different. So the majority of all of the matter in the universe, that is kind of you know, solid stuff uh, that has like a, a mass, has a weight to it. The majority of that matter in the universe is what we call dark matter. 
So far more than there is all the stuff you can see, the stuff that makes us up, that makes up the earth, the sun, everything you can see, this is all ordinary matter. This is stuff like protons and neutrons and electrons, if you break it down. Um, but this is only a tiny fraction of what there actually is in the universe. The majority of the matter in the universe is this completely invisible stuff called dark matter. And we really have no idea what this stuff is, what it's made of, what its properties are. All we really know about it is that it's invisible and that it's heavy, okay? But that's pretty much it. Um, so how do we know it's there? You know, if it's invisible, how could you possibly tell whether it's there or not? Well, it comes from thinking about uh, the galaxies. So galaxies are big collections of stars. There's something like uh, 100 billion stars in our galaxy, something like 100 trillion galaxies. So enormous numbers of stars in these galaxies. Um, now, if you count all of the stars in the galaxy, or you try to count them all, and you kind of, you know roughly how heavy a star is, uh, you can use those two pieces of information to kind of figure out how much the galaxy weighs, okay? Um, but when you do that calculation, you realize that if the galaxy just weighed as much as you calculated, uh, it wouldn't be stable. It would kind of fly apart. So there has to be extra stuff in the galaxy that sort of holds it together, that makes it heavier and causes it to stick together. Now, you'd think that we'd be able to see this stuff. If there's lots of extra matter in the galaxy, surely we can see it. You can get a telescope and you can look at it, but you can't. The fact is when you look at the galaxy, when you look at other galaxies in the universe, um, all you see is, is the bright luminous matter, the stars, but you don't see this extra matter that we know has to be there because if it wasn't there, the galaxies would, would fly apart, okay? So we call this matter dark matter. And that's how we know it's there because if it wasn't there, the way that the galaxies spin and the way that they sort of stick together would not be the same as we observe. So we sort of know it's there indirectly by understanding the effect that it has on the way that the galaxies spin and stick together. But that doesn't mean we know what it's made of. So we've got no idea what dark matter is made of, what kind of particles uh, we can describe it as. And this is a big mystery in physics. Um, you know, like I say, if the point of particle physics is to understand all the things that make up the stuff in the universe, and actually all we can do is describe 3% of them, that's pretty embarrassing. So this is a big problem and it's one that we need to solve. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say is that if you, if you have questions, I've got a great list of questions from you that I would love to, uh, to hear you raise if, if you have any questions or any different questions throughout. So please don't hesitate to just stick your hand up, okay? Um, before that though, the other thing I wanted to talk about is just what exactly um, it means to be a physicist and how you become a physicist and what other paths you can go into if you study physics. So maybe I can start by just giving you a little background on uh, where I'm from and uh, how I got to where I am right now. So I grew up in the UK, as you can probably tell, and I went to a high school, um, just a normal high school, normal sort of state high school. Um, and of course you have to work hard. You have to study hard while you're in uh, middle school and high school all the way through. And then after studying hard, I, I got a place at Oxford University to study physics. So I did my degree and, and my master's degree at Oxford in physics and theoretical physics. And then I'm, I'm doing my PhD at the moment as well. Um, but, you know, lots of people study physics and don't go on to do a PhD. They don't go on to become physicists or become researchers. So there are lots of jobs that people can do with physics. Um, an important part of studying a physics degree is you often do quite a bit of computer programming. So you learn you know, about software and things like that. And of course, that's a really in-demand skill uh, in the age we live in today. So a lot of people that go on, that do physics at college or engineering or maths at college, they go on to do something um, in software or in technology. And this can be very rewarding, you know, financially rewarding and uh, interesting and challenging. Um, but there are other career paths too. So a lot of people go into finance from doing physics, which 
uh, I don't know much about, but I mean, I gather it's pretty well paid. So that's if that's your motivation, that's a good benefit. Um, but in any field, really, what, whatever you're, uh, you'd like to do as your career, a, a college education where you've studied some science is really useful because science is, is difficult for everyone. You know, physics is difficult for me. Uh, it's difficult for anybody that studies it. So if you've done some science and done some physics in college, uh, it shows employers that you're willing to do things that are difficult, that you've got some good problem solving abilities for you know, tackling problems in physics. And it also shows that you've got a good mathematical ability because physics is kind of um, unique amongst the other sciences in that you really need to know quite a lot of maths as well to get on with physics. Uh, and that can be tough. You know, I mean, I find maths tough. Everybody finds maths tough. Um, but a lot of things in life that are worth doing are worth do doing because they are difficult. Um, you know, you, there's not really any such thing, I think, as... Uh, as a as natural ability to do these things everybody finds it difficult some people find it more difficult some people find it a little easier but these things are tough so you don't have to be some kind of super genius to do physics or do any kind of science at college you just have to enjoy it and you have to be willing to put in the hard work okay so you shouldn't feel uh, discouraged because you find things difficult in in class when you're doing science because it's kind of fun finding things difficult. You know, if you have that kind of mindset where it's enjoyable to be challenged and it's enjoyable to have to work hard and think hard, think about these difficult things, you know, it can be a, a very um, fulfilling experience to study something difficult, okay? And of course, it's interesting too. You know, physics is, um, I think it's naturally interesting to everybody. It's about everything that goes on in the world around us. You know, I mean, all of science is interesting, but physics really gets to the core of how everything works. You can understand all sorts of different systems using physics. Biologists use physics to understand the kind of the tiny processes inside of cells at a sort of molecular level. Chemists use physics all the time when they're thinking about you know, electrons moving around uh, in atoms and all sorts of things. So physics is really a very kind of central subject to all sciences. OK, and it can provide answers to important questions we have about where we came from. You know, it explain it sort of goes the furthest to explaining where the universe came from, how the, the Earth was formed, where, you know, uh, where our moon came from. All these different questions about why the world around us looks the way it does are questions that you answer with physics. So it's an important subject to understand and it can give you a lot of, you know, meaning and curiosity and excitement when you look at the world if you understand where these things come from or you ask questions why is that the way it is where did this come from why does that look like that that's what being a physicist is about it's about being curious and about trying to answer these questions okay so there were some great questions uh, that you guys sent in so i think um uh the there was a, a question earlier that um miss bales asked which was that what does a typical work day look like for me so so i should explain so i'm currently doing my my phd in physics hopefully finishing it next year uh and a phd is a little bit different to uh you know the kind of classes that you take and the kind of classes you'll take in college because it's not about doing courses where you know the answer where the, the professor has all the answers Doing a PhD is about looking at problems that nobody has solved yet or trying to discover things that nobody has discovered yet. So it's really exciting because, you know, sometimes you get these moments where you're thinking about something or you're trying to work something out. And when you come to a conclusion, you know, you might be the only person on the planet that knows the thing that you've just found out. So it's about finding new scientific explanations. So it's really exciting. Uh, but as for what my typical workday looks like, you know, I go into my office in the physics department. I talk with my friends. I talk with the other PhD students. We talk about physics and about things that are not physics. We usually drink quite a lot of coffee. Coffee is a crucial ingredient to doing theoretical physics. Um, and then I'm often at my laptop. So I will be writing code to try and uh, solve equations or I'll be writing stuff in my notebook or on my iPad and uh, trying to do a lot of math basically. So I'm a theoretical physicist, which means I, I don't work in a lab. I don't 
play with lasers and magnets and stuff like that. All of my stuff is kind of mathematical. So it's about writing equations and solving equations. Okay. Um, but you know, the best parts of my day are, are talking to other people, talking to other physicists and asking them, what are they working on? What are they thinking about? And then chatting about what I'm thinking about, and what I'm working on. So science is a very social uh, subject. You know, it's a very social thing to be doing. It's absolutely not the case. Like some people have the impression that it's kind of, you know, these crazy mad scientists working alone in a lab in a room, lots of explosions and crazy things going on. Um, you know, we talk to each other and we enjoy spending time with each other and, and, and chatting about physics. That's a really crucial part of doing science. Okay. So um, I thought I'd pause at this point just to see, does anyone have any questions about what I've said so far about the, the dark matter stuff or talking about my day more practically, anything like that? No? Do you have a question? Have we proven that the same like atom bases are our Uh Could you speak up a little bit? Sorry, it's a little hard to hear at the back. Are the same? Have we proven that the same atom bases are outside of our galaxy, like the protons and neutrons? I'm sorry, I can't. If you come like maybe closer to the front, or perhaps Miss Bells can, can repeat it. Yeah, I'll repeat it for you. She's saying, Thank have you. we proven that like what we understand is the atom, like the protons, neutrons, and electrons? Like, does that even exist outside of our you know, solar system or universe? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So we do know that um, the sort of the atomic structures that we have in our solar system are the same as they are in other parts of the galaxy. Um, because the, the, the main way that astronomers identify whether you're looking at, you know, an element of hydrogen or helium or lithium or something else is we look at the, the light that comes out of them. Okay, so all different elements, they have what we would call a unique spectra. So they release certain colors of light uh, that are like a fingerprint to them. So they have a unique fingerprint. So if you look at some hydrogen on Earth from a, you know, a hydrogen lamp or something, um, if you look at the light that comes from it in a very close way, you split it up using you know, a prism or something like that, you can tell that it has this unique fingerprint. And if you look at light that's coming from very far away, very distant galaxies, even from you know, very early on in the universe, billions of, billions of years ago, um, it has the same fingerprint. So these atoms have the same sort of signature as they do on Earth today. So we have all of these diff this evidence that uh, says the laws of physics where we are today and all the, the atoms, molecules, etc., where we are today are the same as they are in every other part of the universe that we can see at least. Now, there are parts of the universe that we can't see because you may know that our, our universe is expanding um, and our universe is expanding so fast that the parts of it that are very far away from us are expanding quicker than the light can catch up to get into our eyes. OK, so things that are very far away from us are moving away from us so quickly that uh, you can't see them, that sort of the light that would be coming from them today cannot travel quick enough to catch up with the space between us that's getting wider and wider. Um, and in the very early universe, the universe actually grew incredibly quickly. There's this sort of exponential uh, growth of the universe very early on that we call inflation. And this sort of creates these kind of disconnected patches um, of the universe where you know, something that happens in one part today cannot influence something that happens in another part today. And um, it's possible because we can't measure these differences in these uh, regions of space. They may have slightly different laws of physics or different amounts of different kind of matter than we have in our little patch of space. But the point is we could never know because we can never measure these things. This is sort of one class of uh, multiverse. Sometimes people call them multiverses, but there are different kinds of multiverse. So. Um, we don't always use that terminology. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, are there any more before I talk about something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the uh, in the middle row, I think you had your hand up first. Um, do you mostly work with space or do you work with stuff here on Earth? 
Uh, did you say space or stuff here on Earth? Yeah, do you mostly work with space? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So because, because I'm a particle physicist, um, the stuff that I'm interested in is here on Earth and it's here in space and it's everywhere. Okay, because the universe is, is you know, pretty much the stuff that is here on Earth is the same as the stuff that is in the sun, the same as the stuff that is in other galaxies. It's all about the most basic building blocks of what stuff is made of. So I do think a lot about space because um, in, in my research, I'm very interested in this dark matter that I mentioned, this sort of invisible, heavy stuff that we don't know what it is, but we know that it helps the galaxy stick together. And um, the best way that we can think so far that we can try and understand what dark matter is, is to think about dark matter in space. So dark matter in the universe, rather than trying to create it or uh, detect it here on Earth, like uh, we do with other particles. So you may have heard of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. This is this big particle accelerator um, that smashes protons together and creates new particles. And then from the, we look at these new particles and uh, you know you can try and understand them from those experiments where you, you create the new particles. Now, we don't know how to do that with, with dark matter. We don't know really how to detect dark matter on earth very well. So what I, uh, one thing I'm working on at the moment with um, colleagues uh, at UC Riverside and uh, my professor at UC Riverside is to understand how the presence of dark matter might affect um, these very tiny sort of almost invisible particles called neutrinos that are released from supernovae. So this sounds kind of silly. We're trying to detect an invisible particle by looking at a nearly invisible particle, which you might think just doesn't really make things much easier. Um, but the truth is we don't have much choice because dark matter basically doesn't touch anything else. Dark matter, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't have like a charge. It's not magnetic really. So, you know, you can't look at how it interacts with protons and electrons. So you've got to look at these other things that are a lot more subtle in how they interact. So I do think a lot about space. So space is how we're hoping we might uh, shed a, a little bit of new light on dark matter by looking at how all the dark matter spread out in our galaxy and between our galaxies interacts with these neutrino particles that are, that are released from supernovae. That's sort of our hope is to shed some light on it from them. Okay. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think there was a, did you have a question at the front as well? Yeah. So do you know how far or close the closest black hole is and hypothetically how long it would take a black hole to like absorb our galaxy or something or our mm -hmm. solar system or something? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think our closest black hole is, is a little over a, a thousand light years away. Uh, I think I have it on somewhere up here. It's called HR um, 6819. So it's about 1,120 light years away. And you can see it's absolutely tiny. You know, if you compare it with the size of, of the earth, um, black holes are incredibly small because they're, you know, they're like some things that are bigger than the mass of the sun. So they're heavier than the sun, but they're about the size of a city on earth. So, you know, this black hole uh, might be a hundred times the mass of our sun, but it might be the size of the city that you live in, the town that you live in. So very small. Um, so yeah, this, our closest one is very far away from us, which is a good thing. It's not good to have black holes too close to you, really. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so if things fall into black holes, black holes sort of consume things. Um, and the special thing about black holes is that what falls in cannot come out. So once something falls in, it's not able to escape. There's a, there's a sort of horizon to the black hole beyond which when anything falls in here, it can't come out. It's trapped inside. Um, so the question was about how long would it take a black hole to, to sort of suck up our, our galaxy? And well, fortunately there is no black hole that's, that's big enough to, you know, suck our entire galaxy in. Um, we have at the center of our galaxy, a supermassive black hole. So we think that pretty much every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center. And these, you know, these are very big. These are like um, 
something like uh, between 100,000 and, and a billion times the mass of our sun, I've got written down here. Um, and these are special because we think that without these black holes at the center of the galaxy, the galaxy wouldn't be able to get formed in the first place. So they kind of act like seeds for forming the galaxy. And they're pretty bright as well. So um, there was a, a question from somebody on the, the sheet about quasars. So a uh, quasar is, is a name for uh, a very active black hole, a black hole that produces a large amount of X-rays and, and gamma rays. So as material falls into a black hole, um, the gravity is very strong. So the material falls in, it falls in very quickly. It gets very fast. It, the material kind of rubs up against each other and it produces an enormous amount of heat and enormous amount of energy. And this can lead to these uh, this release of X-rays from this very, very hot material that we can then detect on Earth, okay? So um, there are lots of black holes in our galaxy. They're pretty far apart. Most of them are pretty small, except the center of our galaxy, there is an enormous supermassive black hole, which is called Sagittarius A star. And uh, this releases a lot of powerful X-rays that we can detect. So this is, it's, it's a very reasonable question to ask, well, how do we know black holes exist? Because there are a couple of problems with spotting black holes. First of all, they're very tiny. And second of all, they're black and space is also black. So it's not like you can look at them on a background and, and see where they are because the background is the same color as they are. So it's very hard to, to visibly see black holes. And we've actually only taken a picture of a black hole once a few years ago, you may have, seen this picture, it kind of looks like a, like a ketchup stain on a black napkin or something. Um, but there are other ways that we know black holes exist. So these X-rays that are released by the spinning disk of material that falls into the black hole is one sign that there is a black hole there. And also these ripples in space that are released when two black holes collide together. So in, in 2015, we measured um, with the LIGO facilities that are, this stands for um, Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave uh, Observatory or something. But it basically just, there are these huge sort of kilometer long tubes that can measure the tiniest little sort of ripples in space. So when two black holes collide, they merge together, just like dropping a rock in a pond, they produce these ripples that spread out um, on the surface. You know, like on the surface of a pond, they spread out through space, okay? And we can detect these. We were able to detect these as a sort of signature that there was a black hole there. But actually visibly seeing them is very difficult. So usually when, if, you, if you've seen this picture of a black hole, what you're actually seeing uh, is the accretion disk, okay? So it's this bright spinning material that's falling in, okay? Good. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, there's a question in the middle there. Do distant black holes allow us to look back in time the same way different gal distant galaxies do? Oh, good. Yeah, this was, a, this was another question that was on the sheet. Excellent. Yeah, so the thing about looking further in space, meaning further back in time, is not specific to galaxies. That's a great question. So the reason that looking further back in space means you're looking back in time is just that light takes a long time to travel very big distances. So our universe has a, has a speed limit to it, which is the speed of light. So nothing can travel faster than light. Light travels at 300 million meters per second. So it's very quick, but the universe is very big. You know, the distance between our, uh, us and our nearest star uh, is over three light years. So that means it takes three years for the light to get there to us from there. Um, our sun is about eight light minutes away, which means when you're looking up at the sun, although don't look directly at the sun, if you're looking you know, in the direction of the sun, uh, the light that you see that's entering your eye has taken eight minutes from the surface of the sun to where we are. So in a sense, you're always looking back in time. Even when you're looking at each other across, across the classroom, the light that, come, that bounces off one of your friend's faces has not instantly got into your eye. It has to travel from your, your friend to your eyes. So you're only looking a very tiny little amount back in time then. But of course, if you've got huge distances, like the distance to 
uh, our nearest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, or to our nearest black hole, it doesn't matter whether it's a black hole or a galaxy. What causes you to be looking back in time is the fact that they are very far away. Okay, so it is exactly the same. If you look at a very distant black hole, you're looking at it in the distant past, just like you would with a galaxy. That's a great question. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? I think at the back, you had your hand up just before the very back. Yeah. What is the hardest obstacle you've ever faced in your job? The hardest obstacle I've ever faced in my job? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, like I mentioned earlier, physics is difficult. It, it's difficult for everybody. You know, it takes a lot of study, a lot of hard work, and uh, a lot of hard thinking time. So the job itself is difficult in the sense that the problems are hard. You know, the, the math can be hard. Trying to understand these things, you know, trying to wrap your head around black holes and other things is difficult. It's challenging to do. But it's also very fun. You know, it, it's not a hard job in the way that um, you know, um, I mean, your teacher's job is a hard job. Teaching is very hard. I do a little bit of teaching at university, but it's not as difficult as, as the teaching uh, that Miss Bales has to do, because it's a lot more full on. You teach a lot more classes as a, as a middle school teacher than you do as a graduate student or, or even as a professor. So it's hard in a different way. It's hard because it's intellectually challenging. You know, these things are difficult to think about. Um, but, you know, it's not, it, luckily, it's not physically exhausting. I don't have to work on an oil rig and, you know, lift heavy machinery and stuff like that. So it's a good job. It's a, it's a job I enjoy very much, but it's difficult in a very nice way in that I enjoy these difficult problems. And um, it's, a, it's a good thing to get used to, being stuck on something. Sometimes when you're in school, um, maybe not where you are now, but perhaps where you were younger in school, if you were in elementary school or something, you know, getting a bunch of math problems, well, even the name kind of sounds bad. Problem we use for something difficult, something that is not good. You know, if you have a problem with your car, that's a bad thing. You've got to go get it fixed. That's very bad. Whereas if you have a math problem, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> so the terminology makes you a little bit biased towards doing math problems because you associate, might associate them with your car breaking down or having a problem with your teeth where you have to go to the dentist. So getting used to being stuck on things is a really great frame of mind to be in um, and not feeling stupid if you can't do something. You know, I, ha I get stuck on math problems every day. I spend my life getting, getting stuck on math problems and, and physics problems. So once you get in the state of mind where you enjoy that and it's, it's interesting and you kind of, you want to get to the answer and you don't mind about sort of being a little, you know, feeling silly along the way and asking people lots of questions and saying, I don't understand this. Can you explain this to me? Um, it becomes a lot more fun when you sort of leave that need to know everything and get everything right first time. If you leave that at the door, um, you learn a lot more and you enjoy a lot more when you're learning. Okay. So yeah, that, I guess the, the physics itself is the hardest part about my job, the toughest obstacle, um, but it's a good obstacle. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, in the middle. Mm -hmm. So do black holes suck things in only from one direction or from multiple directions? Um, what do you mean by in both directions? Do you mean like, for, so like the black hole? So, ah, oh, okay, I can kind of understand what you mean. So this is a really good point. So it's kind of hard to picture what a black hole looks like. Because when I say hole, you might think of like a, a hole in a golf course where, you know, it's sort of like a flat thing, right? That there's, a, there's an entrance to the hole. And then once you're in the hole, you're in it. Um, but a black hole is actually like a 3D hole. So you've got a kind of picture like a 3D sphere. Okay. So there's no back end to a black hole. There's no front end to a black hole. The whole thing is just one sphere in 3D space. And anything can fall in in any direction in that sphere. So it can fall in through the top, through the side, through the bottom, through the back. It's all one hole. So a hole is a kind of bad name because it makes you think about, you know, just like a single opening, a single entrance. Um, but a black hole is a 3D version of this. So, you know, you can picture like picture our Earth, of course, is a sphere, but then imagine it completely black and you can fall in through it into the inside of the sphere, but you can't go out the other end. You can't come out of it once you've entered the inside. Okay. 
but that's a really great question. So picturing a black hole is, is quite tricky to do because they are 3D, they're not 2D. It's not a 2D hole, it's a 3D hole, okay? Uh, any more questions? It's okay if not, I have a couple more things about black holes to talk about. Um, so maybe let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the time travel properties of black holes. Well, for, actually, before we do that, let me talk a little bit about where black holes come from. Um, so black holes are formed from stars that have run out of fuel. So inside of our star, inside of our sun, um, all the heat and the light that our sun emits is produced by a process called nuclear fusion. So the very strong gravity of the sun squashes the, uh, the protons and neutrons together inside of the star's core, and it turns them into helium atoms. And in doing so, it releases quite a lot of energy. So this, by the way, this is the best way we could ever make energy on Earth. So you might hear people talking about cold fusion sometimes, uh, about getting nuclear fusion to work on Earth. And the reason this is such a great idea is that if you can do it, you have a near infinite supply of completely clean energy uh, that produces nothing but helium gas. And helium gas is totally harmless. And it's actually also very valuable. It's very useful for medical processes and other things. So cold fusion, if you can get it to work on Earth, is you know, we've solved our energy crisis completely, but it's very difficult to get to work. It's easy in the sun because the sun has very strong gravity, but of course you can't recreate something like the sun on earth. But because the sun is producing this heat by using up hydrogen, converting it into helium within its core, eventually it will run out of this hydrogen. So eventually the star will run out of this fuel that's needed to produce heat. Uh, and as you may know from what you've seen uh, in class, if you've done any experiments, when things get cold, they actually kind of contract, they sort of shrink. And this is especially true for a star because the star is also being squashed down by gravity. So when the star has run out of fuel, uh, it starts to collapse in on itself, okay? And this sort of implosion, this collapse of the star can trigger an explosion. So it's implosion triggering explosion. And this explosion we call a supernova. So supernova is where the inside of the core sort of explodes and it catapults the outer layers of the star out into space. So the star sort of spews its guts up into the surrounding space. And if the star is big enough, what's left behind, this very dense core of the star has collapsed and it keeps collapsing and it keeps collapsing and keeps collapsing until it basically forms a point that has an infinite density. So you've got a huge amount of mass in a tiny, tiny point of space. And we call this a singularity, a space-time singularity. And this is what, the, what is at the core of every black hole. So black holes are formed by collapsing stars. And the very strong gravity of the black hole leads to all sorts of really strange properties that involve how time progresses, how uh, lengths are affected when they come near a black hole. And those are what I want to talk about now. So I want to talk about what black holes do in terms of uh, time travel. So imagine we've got two people that are sort of fairly near a black hole. Uh, you've got person A who's going to dive headfirst into the black hole and you've got person B who is going to stand outside and watch person A dive in. So depending on who you ask, whether you're talking to person A or to person B, the conclusion of this experiment will be quite different, okay? So person A who is diving into the black hole, they will fall towards it, they will see the black hole coming towards them as they enter, uh, and they will be able to enter it just fine. They will enter through the horizon of the black hole and pass through into its interior. Now, what they see in that interior, we can never know because it's not like they can you know send us a text message from within the black hole because not only can you know no light can escape the black hole and that includes mobile phone signal that includes gps that includes everything nothing can get out of the black hole okay so they can never tell us what they see but what they experience when they fall into the black hole is quite interesting so there is a scientific name for what happens to this person as they fall in and this is called spaghettification so you may have heard this term before, but it's a proper, it's a real scientific term, I promise you. And it comes from the fact that 
when this person is jumping towards the black hole, the gravity that the black hole pulls on the guy with is incredibly strong. And not only is it incredibly strong, it's much stronger at his head level than it is at his feet level if he's diving in head first. So you can kind of imagine this is like, you know, you're being pulled at the head and pulled at the feet, but suddenly the force that you're being pulled up at the head by is much, much bigger than how you're being pulled at your feet. And this is literally going to stretch the guy out and draw him out into like a strand of spaghetti, which is why we call this spaghettification. So black holes are dangerous. You know, obviously you don't want to fall into a black hole. First of all, you can never get out. Second of all, you're probably going to get ripped apart before you even get inside. So they're very dangerous things. Um, now, you don't always get ripped apart by a black hole. Some black holes are more dangerous than others. So actually, it's the tiny black holes that are more dangerous. They will sort of rip people apart, whereas the big ones are actually a little bit safer. Okay. But person B, well, actually, let's talk a little bit more about what person A feels. So person A is able to fall into the black hole just fine. But let's suppose that they kind of fall in with their back to the black hole. So they look out and they look at person B, who's on the outside, the blue guy, as they're falling in. Now, what they will see happen because of the way that black holes distort and change time when you're in their proximity, person A, the red guy falling in, will see the entire history of the universe occur in a very short period of time. They will see person B go gray and age and die. They will see the stars in the nearby galaxies begin to go out one by one. They will see new black holes formed as those big stars die. And you know, if the black hole is big enough, they may even see the end of the universe itself. They will see time in the universe spread out in front of them in an instant, okay? So they will travel forwards in time very quickly. Now, they won't you can't travel backwards in time, we don't think, but traveling forwards in time, that's perfectly possible. And black holes are really nature's time machines. Now, this, this won't be unfamiliar if you've seen the film Interstellar, for example, where you know when they're on the water planet that's very near the black hole, it's something like every hour is like seven years back on Earth or something. Now, this is accurate. This is real science. So this is what person A, the guy falling into the black hole, sees. The person that is watching them fall into the black hole see something quite different. So according to the blue guy that's outside of the black hole, he never sees person A actually pass into the black hole itself. He sees person A sort of approach very slowly, get closer and closer to the horizon, and then eventually get sort of smeared across the surface. So he never sees them pass inside of it. So there's a difference, there's a duality between what one person sees and what the other person sees, but they're consistent. So neither one can tell the other one that they are wrong because as person B watches person A get into the black hole, person A can't communicate with him anymore, okay? Because once he gets that close to the black hole, you know, all his radio signals trying to communicate with the guy outside get sort of stretched and are lost and he can't keep in touch anymore. So black holes are really very strange objects. They change the way that time is experienced by people that are near them. And they lead to these sort of apparent contradictions between what happens when someone falls into a black hole. So if you're the guy falling into the black hole, you can pass into it just fine. But if you look out as you're falling in, you see time move very quickly. You see all your friends get much older and you see stars die, planets form, all this stuff happen. Um, but if you're watching someone fall in, you never see them actually fall in. So time gets really mixed up by black holes. Okay. Uh, I wonder if there's uh, any questions on that while we, uh, before we move on. So yeah, there's a question on the, on the right, on the left there. How do people like, know that's what happens? Because like no one's ever like done it. How is it? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So it's a, it's a brilliant question because obviously we've never been to a black hole. You know, we've never visited one, so we can't do an experiment. I can't, uh, someone in the last cast suggested strapping a GoPro and putting someone into a black hole. You know, it would be not very good for the guy that's going into the black hole, uh, but it would be an interesting experiment, but we can't do that. So black holes are kind of special in physics because 
they involve two of these different big theories. So we have two theories in physics, two big theories. We've got the theory of the very small, which is quantum theory. And we've got the theory of the very heavy, which is Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity. Now, black holes are kind of awkwardly in the middle of these two because they're very small. The singularity at the center of the black hole is tiny, but it's also very heavy. It's got a mass, you know, sometimes thousands of times bigger than our sun. So the theory that predicts what's inside of a black hole, well, we don't have that theory. That theory doesn't exist yet. It would be something called quantum gravity. And we don't yet know what that theory looks like. There are some suggestions like string theory is one possibility, but we don't have an understanding of it. But what goes on outside the black hole and towards the edge, we actually have good theories for this. So this is, comes from Einstein's theory of gravity. And Einstein's theory of gravity tells us what we expect to see. And we have faith in Einstein's theory of gravity because we've tested it in other situations and it's proved to be very accurate. So we kind of, you know, you sort of test your theory in one circumstance and then you make predictions in another. And if you have no reason to doubt it, if you've never found any evidence that it's wrong, we trust in those predictions that it makes. But that's a brilliant question about how theoretical physics works in general. And I think we're about a minute from the end. Is, is that correct? Yes. Last okay. call for a question. Tanat, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. Nice to meet you all. Yes, and we have a five minute passing period here and then we'll jump in with six hour. Okay, great. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. Um, so uh, like Miss Bell says, I'm Rob, I'm a theoretical particle physicist. So I'm just finishing my PhD. Um, and I wanna to talk to you a little bit about physics, about what physics is. Uh, about becoming a physicist, about what you can do uh, if you decide to take some physics classes in college or you know, take it as like an AP in high school and things like that. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about black holes and about dark matter. So there are some fantastic questions um, that uh, Miss Bale sent to me from your, from your class that I'd love to talk through as well. But any other questions that come up, um, you know, I'm really happy if you just stick your hand up when I'm talking uh, and I'll stop at an appropriate time and then, and then we can chat about it, okay? So please do, have, do ask questions if you've got questions. So before that though, um, so I know you guys are honors science students. So you're all good students, you all enjoy science. You wanna do some extra tricky science classes, which is great news. So I wanna hear what you think physics is. I wonder if anyone can raise their hand and, and give me what they think physics is about. What do physicists do? So who has an idea? So yeah, at the back there, yeah. Uh, is it just like how everything in the universe works? Yeah, that's as good a definition as, as I could give, exactly. Physics really is quite easy to define because we're basically interested in everything. We're interested in what the universe is made of, so what stuff is in the universe, and then how that stuff behaves. So we want to explain everything if we can. We want to explain how everything works, what everything is made of, and try and have the most complete picture of how the universe works that we can possibly have. So that's a great definition. So if I was to tell you that all the stuff around you right now, all the, the air in the room, the desk, the table, the stuff that makes up our bodies, the earth, the sun, everything. Uh, this is only about 3% of all the stuff that's in the universe. 97% of the stuff that's in the universe is completely invisible and we have no idea what it is, okay? So I'm a particle physicist. So particle physicists, we want to understand the most basic building blocks of what makes up matter. OK, so you know that if you if you break up all the stuff in this room, you can break it up into atoms. Atoms are made up of there's a nucleus and then spinning around the nucleus. There are electrons and the nucleus is made up of two, two sort of different kinds of particle. It's made up of protons and it's made up of neutrons. Um, now, you can split a proton and a neutron up into even smaller pieces. Protons and neutrons are made of things called quarks. OK. These are even tinier little bits. There's three quarks inside a proton, three quarks inside a neutron. 
Um, but what if you try and split up an electron? Well, an electron is actually what we call a fundamental particle. Now that means I can't cut an electron in half. I can't give you half an electron. There's no extra little particles inside of an electron that make it up, okay? And that's the same with these quarks. Once you break up the proton and the neutron into the individual quarks that are inside it, you can't break it up anymore, okay? So as a particle physicist, I'm interested in what are the most basic stuff, basic things that stuff is made of in the universe, okay? So these fundamental particles. So when we look at all the stuff that's in the universe, if only 3% of it is the stuff that's made up of protons and neutrons, electrons, what is the rest of it? Well, it's sort of divided into two things. There is this stuff called dark matter that is, as the name suggests, it's matter, it's, it's made of particles. It, it is something kind of physical. And then there is this stuff called dark energy and dark energy is even more mysterious. We really have no idea where to start with dark energy. But if we stay focused on dark matter for a moment, what I'm saying here is that all of the stuff that you see around you, everything that appears bright, you know, you look at stars in the sky, you look at our sun, you look at the earth, everything in this room that you can see is normal matter. But this is only a tiny fraction of all the matter in the universe. Most of the stuff in the universe is completely mysterious, okay? We've got no idea what it is. It's completely invisible and completely mysterious. So you may well ask then, well, how do we know that it's there? If it's invisible, if it's totally mysterious, we know very little about it. You know, how do we even know that it exists? And that's a good question. So we know that dark matter exists based on how our galaxy looks. So, uh, you know, a galaxy, our galaxy contains something like 100 billion stars, an enormous collection of stars. And if you sort of count all of these stars, or you kind of roughly count them all, and you know how heavy our own sun is, you can kind of estimate the weight of the galaxy. You can try and weigh our galaxy. Um, but when you calculate the weight of our galaxy, based on looking at all of these stars and all this dust and this visible stuff you can see, the number that you get is sort of confusing. Um, it's a lot lighter than the galaxy should be in order to sort of stay stuck together. So there has to be something else within our galaxy uh, that stops it kind of flying apart, that stops it spinning in a kind of weird way that we don't observe. But we can't see this stuff. You can't look at it with a telescope. It doesn't block any light. It doesn't produce any light. It's completely invisible. But it has to be there because if it wasn't there, our galaxy would, be, would not be sort of heavy enough to stay stuck together as it spins. So this is how we know dark matter exists. We know it's there based on looking at very, very big things, based on looking at, uh, at our galaxy and other galaxies. But if you try and think about what it's made of, so, you know, my particle physics mind starts thinking, well, I want to describe things in terms of the most basic little, little Lego pieces that they're made of. I want to break it down into those basic elements. But we can't do that for dark matter. We don't know what it's made of, okay? And because it's invisible, it's very hard to do experiments with it. You know, you, you can't uh, detect it in really any viable way at the moment, or at least we haven't so far detected it. So it's incredibly mysterious. And it's kind of embarrassing if you're a physicist and your whole job description is trying to understand all the stuff in the universe. And 97% of it is completely unknown to us. It's completely mysterious. So although it sounds like a good job title, understanding everything that's in the universe for a physicist, right now, we're not doing such a good job at it. We've got a long way to go to discover what dark matter is, what its properties are, how it behaves. Uh, but this is one of the things I work on. So I uh, work on trying to shine some light on dark matter uh, in one way by looking at how it interacts with these other particles that are, that are nearly invisible, but not quite invisible, called neutrinos. Uh, that are produced in very large numbers from supernovae when, when stars die and explode. So we sort of look, we're thinking about particles, we're thinking about these tiny, uh, you know, little things that make up everything, but we're trying to understand them by looking at space, by looking at supernovae and very big distances, very big sizes. So using the very big to try and understand the very small. So it's an interesting mix of those two ideas, okay? 
So I wanted to talk a little bit now about what it takes to be a physicist, why I think physics is a great thing to go into. And I hope you know, you'll all consider it when you're thinking about what classes you're going to take in high school and what, what you're going to do at college when you eventually go to college. So I'll start with just a little background on me. So as I'm sure you can tell from the accent, I grew up in the UK. Uh, I went to just a normal high school, um, just a normal you know, state, state run high school, not a private school or anything like that. Um, and I had to work hard. You know, physics is difficult. Um, I won't lie to you and say it's not. It's difficult for everyone. It's difficult for me. It's difficult for my professors. It's difficult for my collaborators and colleagues. Everybody finds it difficult. But, you know, in life, sometimes the things that are worth doing are difficult. Um, and there's an excitement in that, too. There's an excitement in finding something challenging and finding a difficult puzzle or a problem that you can't solve. OK. Uh, I personally think the word problem, so, you know, math problem, physics problem, is maybe a little bit of bad language, because usually when you think of problem, you think of, ah, my car's broken down, I've got to take it to the mechanic, there's a problem with the engine, or, oh, there's a problem with my tooth, I've got to go to the dentist and get a filling. So you can kind of think about math problems the same, oh, I've got this math problem, I've got to solve it, that's so annoying. But actually, a math problem is a good kind of problem. You know, I prefer to think of it as a puzzle like doing a crossword, doing something for fun, doing a Sudoku. Uh, it's, it's interesting and entertaining. And math problems and physics problems are the same kind of thing. Okay, so in, this, in a sense, that, you know, the only requirement to become a physicist is that you have to enjoy these difficult problems or learn to enjoy them. Okay, and that takes a couple of things. It means leaving your need to always know everything and to always be right at the door. So getting used to finding things tricky and, and learning to love finding things tricky and finding things difficult. Um, so after high school, I, I then went to Oxford University where I did my degree and uh, my master's degree. And then I've moved on to my PhD. So I should explain a PhD is a little bit different to you know, your, your kind of classes in school and uh, the classes you'll take in college. Because the point of a PhD is not to learn stuff that people have already discovered and to go to classes where the professor knows the answer and they'll tell you if you're right or if you're wrong. The point of a PhD is to discover something new, to learn about new things that people haven't yet discovered in science. And that makes it exciting because it means sometimes, you know, there are moments where you're working on something or you realize something and you may be the only person on the planet or the only person in the world that has ever realized that particular thing. So it's an exciting moment, you know, when you sort of realize something or discover something like that. Um, so as a career, physics is, you know, for me, physics research. So do being a scientist, being a researcher is a really great job. It's something... I enjoy very much because it's exciting and uh, uh, I love talking to my friends and my colleagues about physics and you know I get to travel and go to conferences and talk to classes of students like you which I love doing um, so you know talking about science and about these incredible things in our universe is a lot of fun but not everyone who does physics at college goes on to be a researcher there are lots of other jobs people do um, many of them completely unrelated to physics so when you're when you're applying for a job if you've studied some physics in college or if you've taken a degree in physics it demonstrates quite a few things to that employer uh, that are very desirable so it demonstrates that you're not scared of doing things that are difficult tackling difficult problems um, it demonstrates that uh, you're a good problem solver because a lot of physics is solving problems solving these puzzles uh, and it shows dedication because a physics degree is difficult. Studying physics is difficult. So whether or not you do anything actually in physics, taking physics at college and in high school and as an AP or something like that is a really good thing to do. OK. And there are more practical skills as well. So as part of a physics degree, pretty much everybody will learn some kind of computer programming language. So a lot of people go into tech, into you know, software stuff out of the back of a physics degree. Um, people go into finance, where I don't know much about this, but you're working in finance, you earn a lot of money. And if that's what motivates you, that's something a physics degree can help you do. And in general, science, engineering, maths degrees, all of these have so many transferable skills that make you very appealing to an employer. So whatever career you go into, 
a science degree is kind of a fantastic stepping stone to get your foot in the door in really whatever industry you want to go into. Okay, so it's well worth considering. But you know, that's the reason I've done it is because I, I love physics. Physics is interesting. It's sort of uh, it's an important part of the human experience to be curious and to want to learn more about the world. And physics is what allows us to do that most efficiently. You can answer you can answer questions about the tiniest things in our universe, smaller than an atom, and the biggest things in our universe, looking at you know galaxies and the universe as a whole. So this, the, the breadth of questions you can answer is enormous. If you have even just a little bit of knowledge about physics, you don't have to study physics for you know, uh, eight years, nine years like I have. Just taking a few classes in college, you'll be able to understand things you see in the world so much more clearly than somebody who hasn't taken any physics. So it's a great way to be, to be educated and to understand the world around you, okay? So I wonder if there are any questions before I talk a little bit more about black holes, or does anyone else have any questions about black holes? I'm interested to hear uh, any questions you guys have, because there were some great ones uh, Ms. Bale sent me that you submitted before. Yeah, there's a question at the back. Uh, what's like your interest in black holes? What's, what's my interest in what, sorry? What's caused you to be interested in black holes? What caused me to be interested in black holes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would sort of ask a different question. I would ask, if you learn a tiny bit about black holes, why are you not interested in them? <laughs> because they are so fascinating and they are so weird and so bizarre that if you hear a little bit about them, you almost, you can't resist to learn more about them because they're some of the most sort of interesting and exotic um, structures within our universe. So in a sense, they're very simple. They have basically two parts to them. They have a singularity at the center and they have a horizon on the outside that shields that singularity from view. But the properties they have, the way that they can sort of slow down time and speed up time and bend light uh, and cause all sorts of crazy effects and the, the way that they are crucial to the formation of galaxies um, makes them incredibly complex objects in how they behave. So. Perhaps this is a good time to talk a little bit about what a black hole actually is, so the anatomy of a black hole. So like I said, there are kind of two main parts to a black hole. There is this horizon that we call the event horizon, and this is the point of no return. This is the point about which if you fall through this, anything that falls through into the black hole um, cannot escape. You cannot exit the horizon once you've passed through it. So black holes you know, are a one-way street. Um, at the center of a black hole is something we really understand even less than we understand dark matter, another complete mystery. There is what we call a space-time singularity. So you can think of this as a point of infinite density where you've taken you know, potentially the masses of, of thousands of stars and you've squashed them down into something that is you know, smaller than an atom. It's just a point, okay? So this is incredibly dense. This has incredibly strong gravity. And it's what leads to all of these bizarre properties that the black hole has about slowing down time, about not allowing light to escape, all sorts of things like this, okay? Um, another thing is how do you picture a black hole? You know, what does a black hole look like? Well, the name hole is a little bit misleading because you know, if you think of a hole, you think of maybe like a hole on a golf course where there's an entrance and then there's an inside and, and there's only just you know, one little sort of flat 2D entrance, okay? But a black hole is actually a 3D hole. So you've got to imagine you know, a sort of black sphere that you can enter from any direction, from the top, from the side, from the bottom, wherever. So the whole thing is the hole. It's a, it's a hole in 3D, okay? Um, so a common question is about what happens if you were to fall into a black hole. So this is interesting because it actually depends who you ask. So if you imagine you have two people uh, that are sort of sat around the edge of a black hole, there's person A who's going to dive headfirst into the black hole, and there's person B who's going to, to watch that person fall in. So from person A's perspective, they will head towards the black hole and they'll be able to pass through the horizon. And uh, that'll probably be, you know, that'll be okay. They will pass through. And as long as the black hole is not too tiny, 
because tiny black holes are actually much more dangerous. Tiny black holes can cause you to be ripped apart as you enter. But if it's a big enough black hole, they be, they'll be able to pass inside of it. But what person B sees is in disagreement with this. But before we talk about person B, let's talk a little bit more about what person A sees. So as person A falls into the black hole, they experience this thing, and this is a technical term that I think some of you have heard of, uh, they experience spaghettification. So this is exactly what it sounds like when they're diving headfirst into the black hole, the gravity is very strong. And not only is it very strong, it's much stronger at the top of their head than it is at the bottom of their feet. So, you know, this is like, you can imagine being pulled by a rope where, you know, the rope that's attached to your head is pulling you really hard and the rope that's attached to your feet is not pulling you so hard. What it's gonna do is it's gonna stretch you. So as this guy falls into a black hole, they're gonna get stretched apart and they're gonna get drawn out into sort of a strand, just like spaghetti, okay? But that's not the weirdest thing that happens. So as person A is falling into the black hole, this red guy is falling in, let's assume he falls in back first. So he's looking out at the universe as he falls in. Now, as he's looking out at the universe when he falls in, he sees things start to get faster and faster. He sees time start to accelerate in the outside universe. So as I've drawn in this little cartoon here, he sees person B start to age very quickly. Person B will start to grow, you know, turn gray and will grow old and will eventually die. But not only that, as this guy falls into the black hole, he looks out and he sees the whole history of the universe start to occur in quick succession. So he sees distant galaxies collide with each other. He sees stars die. He sees new stars born. He sees you know, maybe he sees civilizations grow, civilizations die. He sees billions of years of the universe's history from that point spread out. And he might even see the end of the universe if the black hole is big enough. So he'll see the universe grow old and cold and dead and eventually die. So black holes really are nat natural time machines. If you fall into a black hole, or even if you just spend a little bit of time near a black hole, you can travel forwards in time much, much quicker than you do anywhere else. Um, now, if you've seen this, the film Interstellar, it's exactly the same as this. That, that is pretty accurate to the science as for what black holes do to time. You know, when they're on this water planet where they're really close to the black hole, it's something like every minute on, on the planet is like seven years on Earth or something. So when they go back to Earth, you know, the, the guy's daughter is now an old lady and is older than, than he was when they left. So this is pretty scientifically accurate. This is what happens if you approach a black hole. You can travel forwards in time. Uh, is that a question in the back? Yeah. Um, so is the person falling into the black hole aging as well? They are aging, but um, they're, they're, from their perspective, they're aging at the normal rate. So they've got, you know, they've got a watch on their wrist. And as they fall in, the watch clicks the same as it does usually. It still clicks one second, dot, 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 dot. It's the people outside for whom <laughs> the guy that's falling in observes time to change. So from his perspective, you know, his watch is correct. Their, his watch doesn't change. Everybody else's watch, that is what appears to be going quickly. But it's a matter of perspective. Sorry, was there a follow-up question? Yeah, what does person B see? Like, does they, do they see person A falling in really slowly? Exactly. Brilliant. Yeah, you're way ahead of me. Fantastic. So this is where there's a disagreement in what the two people see. So person B, this is now from person B's perspective. As he sees person A falling towards the black hole, he actually never sees person B completely cross the horizon. He sees them sort of approach and get closer and closer and eventually kind of spread out over the surface of the horizon, but he never sees him fully pass through it. So he does see person A move in slow motion. You're exactly right. So person A sees person B move very quickly and age very fast and everything else in the universe goes very quickly. But person B sees the guy falling into the black hole do it very slowly and never quite actually pass into it. Okay, so there's a sort of, it seems like there's a contradiction between the two, but there is no contradiction because the only person that's aware that person A falls into the black hole, 
that actually crosses the horizon and gets inside is person A. Only person A can see what they see. So, you know, they if they have a radio, like a communicator, and they're talking to person B as they fall in, you know, they would be talking in to the radio saying, I'm falling into the black hole now, I'm just about to pass the, and they get slower and slower. And they would never be able to tell person B what they see inside because, you know, like person B sees, they never actually see them cross in. So that communication from inside the black hole to outside the black hole is not possible because all of the radio signals, radio signals are just light. They're just a, a longer wavelength of light, just like, you know, the light that we see with our eyes. And because black holes trap everything, including light, and including radio signals, there's no way of communicating what person A sees inside the black hole to anybody that's outside the black hole. So there's no disagreement because person B can't ever even confirm that he did fall in. There's, you know, there's no way to, for him to say that, okay? Only person B is, is on the outside of the black hole and can tell people, uh, yeah, I saw, I saw him get closer and closer, but he never actually fell in, okay? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a good observation. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, in the in the middle. Uh, so, what would happen when person A reaches the center of the black hole? Uh, could you speak up a little bit? Sorry. What would happen when the when person A reaches the center of the black hole? Yeah, that's a great question. So we don't know. We don't know what goes on inside a black hole. We think probably the stuff between the edge, so that is the, the horizon here and the middle, probably the stuff in here is pretty much the same as what goes on outside the black hole. There's nothing too fancy. But what is at the center of the black hole is something completely exotic. Uh, this is, like I mentioned, the space-time singularity. So a space-time singularity is you know, a, a very exotic beast in physics. So within physics, we kind of have two main theories that describe how the world works. You have quantum theory that describes things that are very small. So things like electrons and atoms, protons, neutrons, very tiny things. And then you have Einstein's theory of gravity that we call general relativity. Now, quantum theory works for very small things. General relativity works for very heavy things. But the difficulty is that a black hole is both very small and very heavy. So in order to explain how a black hole works, or how at least the center of a black hole works, the singularity, you have to have a theory that bridges the gap between the quantum and Einstein's theory of gravity. And we would call this quantum gravity if we had this theory. But the sad thing is we don't have this theory. It's very hard to put these two things together. Um, one way people think you might be able to do this is through string theory. So string theory is a theory of quantum gravity, but there are problems with it, and we don't quite know how this fits in with the world we live in. Um, but so to understand the singularity within a black hole, we would have to understand quantum gravity, and we simply don't understand it. So it's very hard to say what happens when the guy gets to the center of the black hole. Um, we can't describe that with our current laws of physics. This is another mystery that physicists want to solve to understand how to put these two things together, quantum and gravity. Okay, but that's a great question. Uh, I think there was, was there another question at the back? On the, whoever had their, their hand up last time, I think. I'm not sure who it was. When black holes emit quasars, is the stuff that comes up. Okay, the next day. Sorry, could you, uh, could you repeat the question, please? Could you just say it a little bit louder? This is the quasar question, Mr. Clemenson, about um, quasars when black holes admit quasars, quasars is it plasma that comes out? Oh, this was the one. This, so this was, is this uh, Sean's question? I think is the name that I have on here. Okay, good. Yeah, so, um, so a quasar is, a, a, a very active kind of black hole. So when stuff falls into a black hole, gravity makes it go very quick. As it falls in very fast, things rub up very fast against each other and they generate a lot of heat. 
And not only do they generate a lot of heat, um, this, this, this large friction between this falling gas and matter spiraling into the black hole causes a very large release of X-rays as well, X-rays and, and gamma rays. So I think the question uh, that I have on the sheet is, is the stuff that comes out plasma? Um, so certainly the stuff in the accretion disk is plasma. Because it's very hot, it's, it's plasma, uh, you, some of you may know, is often called the fourth state of matter. So you know if you heat up a solid, it turns to a liquid. You heat up a liquid, it turns to a gas. In a gas, you've got you know, atoms, and the atoms are allowed to move around, and they bump into each other, and they're pretty much free. But if you heat up a gas even more, you sort of split apart the electrons away from the nucleus. So you do what's called ionizing the gas. You, you turn it into a charged jumble of negative electrons and positive nucleus, okay? Um, and this is what we call a plasma. So plasmas are a, a sort of natural state of matter when things get very, very hot. OK, so the accretion disk certainly contains a lot of plasma. Um, the stuff that is emitted uh, is not emitted from the black hole itself. So like the X-rays are coming out of the accretion disk. It's the infalling matter that causes these X-rays to be released, to my understanding. So I don't think there's any plasma emitted because a lot of the stuff that's that's in the accretion disk, it's kind of it's it's destined to fall into the black hole. It is bound to fall in. But I know that black holes can sort of, uh, there, there's a, an interesting paper I read a while ago about burping black holes, where stuff that is kind of near the black hole that's about to fall in, they can kind of burp it out by some complex process to do with their gravity that can shoot out these little you know, jets of plasma and stuff. So I think they can remove that. Um, but uh, that's a bit more of a, of a rare phenomenon, I think. It's not always being shot out of a quasar, like the X-rays are being shot out of a quasar. But yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think there was another question on the back as well. Yep, yeah. let's go at the back. What is your favorite or most interesting fact about black holes? My most interesting fact about black holes? Um, well, I suppose one of the things that is maybe um, not appreciated about black holes is that they can be very tiny. So although black holes generally are formed from um, the formation of, uh, from, from the collapse of stars, so they're formed when a star loses, runs out of fuel and dies, uh, some black holes can be very small and just very short lived. So some people think there might be black holes, you know, kind of popping in and out of existence around us right now, just sort of tiny microscopic black holes, but they disappear pretty quickly because um, black holes can evaporate. There's this process called Hawking radiation. Um, and there was a question from the other class about if I've met any famous people. So I thought I would show you this picture while I'm talking about it. This is me with Stephen Hawking and some other students at my uh, undergrad college. Um, so there may be very, you know, many sort of tiny black holes around us right now that are kind of just not living very long, just kind of evaporating. I think that's uh, an interesting fact about them. But everything about black holes is interesting, I think. The stuff about the time travel, that's uh, very interesting as well. Yeah, good question. Um, in the middle, on the right or oh. left, I can't tell. <laughs> Or, like, yeah. Theoretically, if you could prolong the life of one of these microscopic black holes and slightly enlarge it, you could probably achieve time travel. Hmm, that's a good question. So, for smaller black holes, the 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 um, I think the uh, the time dilation effect is not so big. So, for a small black hole, it wouldn't be as significant. But it, I mean, you know, it depends how close you are to it, I guess, and it depends how big it is. But, you know, certainly one of these microscopic black holes, the time, you know, the time delay effect would be uh, very tiny. But yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure how you could sustain it because the difficulty is a lot of these black holes are so tiny that they, they can't even sort of, you know, eat, eat a 
a single electron or something, they just sort of immediately disappear. They're very, very tiny. But there are other black, there are, there are potentially other black holes from the early universe that formed very early on before there were uh, lots of stars. These are called primordial black holes. Um, and I'm not sure quite how big they can be. They, they may be different. Then I think there was a question right at the very back in the corner. Uh, could you say it a little bit louder, please? It's a little bit hard to hear. Would you be able to like live forever in a black hole or would you eventually like die? So um, you would still die. So if you think about these, these guys that were falling into the black hole. Um, now person B, he would appear to see person A falling forever. So I guess from his perspective, person A is living forever because they never quite fall again. They're sort of frozen in time and they can't escape. They're sort of stuck on the edge of the black hole. But person A, what they experience, what you feel as you're falling into the black hole, uh, you don't experience living forever. You, you would see everything outside of the black hole moving very quickly, you know, that sort of history of the universe occurring very fast. But from your perspective, you know, your watch still ticks at the same speed. Your hair goes gray at the same rate. You die at the same time. It doesn't really make any difference to you whether or not everyone else is traveling very quick in time. Because from your perspective, your kind of body clock, your, you know, the, the watch on your wrist is still ticking at the same rate. Okay. But, you know, if you travel forward in time, I guess, you know, you come back to Earth and you've only aged one day, but it's 10 years later for everyone on Earth. In a sense, that is like you're living longer because, you know, you're experiencing the future that was otherwise inaccessible to you. But you don't actually live longer. From your perspective, your clock still has just as many ticks as if you were anywhere else. OK. Um, next question. Uh, yes. Earlier you said that a smaller black hole is more dangerous, but why would that be? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's kind of hard to explain without doing a little bit of, of math, but the idea is that what makes the black holes dangerous in terms of, well, I suppose it depends how you want to die is the point. <laughs> so if you're falling into a black hole, you're gonna die, sadly. Um, but whether you want to make it inside, you know, uh, if you want to die inside the black hole or die sort of getting split in half before you even fall in, I suppose that's what determines whether a small one is more dangerous or a big one is more dangerous. So small ones are harder to enter because their gravity changes more rapidly. So a large, a small black hole, uh, the difference in gravity between your head and your feet is much larger than the difference in gravity if you're falling into a big black hole. So a big black hole, you can, you can actually enter smoothly without getting split in half. Whereas a small black hole, you can't quite get, you can't get inside because the gravity changes very quickly. So it will split you in half, okay? So that's what I mean by the small ones are, um, are more dangerous. Uh, Miss Bales, could you pick another student, please? Go to Leia. Um, how long does it take for like a black hole to form? That's a great question. So it happens very quickly when it when it comes to stars collapsing. So I have this little cartoon here, um, you know, of, of sort of showing a little bit of the life cycle of a star. So black holes form when very large stars, so stars much larger than our own sun, run out of fuel, and when they run out of fuel, they cool down. So as you may know from some experiments you might have done in class, when things get cool they contract, just like, you know, when things get hot, they expand, things get cool, they contract. So this is especially true for stars because gravity is also squashing them down. So when a star runs out of fuel, uh, it collapses very rapidly under gravity. And this implosion of the collapsing core of the star triggers an explosion that we call a supernova, where the the exploding core of the star sprays the guts of the outer part of the star around into space and it forms these beautiful structures called nebulae um, that are you know wonderful clouds of gas and dust left behind by exploded stars and right at the center what is left is the black hole assuming the star is sufficiently big 
If it's not big enough, it will form something else, potentially a white dwarf star or a neutron star. But if it's big enough, it will turn into a black hole. And this happens very quickly. This can happen you know, in uh, minutes, basically, very fast. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, can we have another question? Noah, uh, um, has anybody ever like seen a black hole? That's a great question too. So the difficulty with black holes uh, is, as the name suggests, black holes are black and space is also black. So it's pretty hard to spot black holes on a background that looks exactly like them. Um, now, most black holes do not look completely black because of these accretion disks I mentioned. So all of this stuff that falls into the black hole that spirals in quicker and quicker produces a lot of heat and a lot of light. Uh, so if ever you were, to, if you were to see a black hole, what you'd really be seeing, at least from a distance, would be this glowing disk. And we did actually take a picture of a black hole within the last few years. You, you may have seen this picture. It kind of just looks like a, like a ketchup stain on a, on a black napkin or something. It's like a little orange streak. Because what you're actually seeing is not the, the black part of the black hole itself. You're seeing the falling matter, you know, the stars and gas and dust that's falling into the black hole. But there are other ways we can see black holes, not just with visible light. So in 2015, we measured the ripples in space that two colliding black holes formed when they smashed into each other. So black holes collide and they merge to form a bigger black hole. And in doing this, just like if you drop a ripple on a pond, it sends out these, uh, you know, these little shock waves, these ripples across, in this case, through space. You know, literally ripples in the fabric of space. And there's a the facility called the LIGO facility uh, on Earth that can measure these ripples using incredibly clever and sensitive experimental techniques. So you can literally feel, you know, the ripple in space created by two colliding black holes. So there are other ways that we detect them as well as just taking pictures of them. But there's only the one picture so far. Okay, that's a great question though. Uh, oh, yeah. Could you speak up a little bit? It's a little hard to hear with the mic. Could you possibly harness energy from a black hole using a Poisson sphere? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. Could you? You could either come closer, or perhaps Miss Bells could repeat it. Yeah. So, can you harvest energy from a black hole using a Dyson sphere? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so for those of you that don't know it, a, a Dyson sphere is a hypothetical um, megastructure that um, uh, the famous physicist called Freeman Dyson uh, from the 20th century hypothesized that a, a, a super advanced society might build. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a big sphere that kind of is, you know, it's like a metallic structure or some, some advanced material structure that wraps around an entire star, possibly an entire solar system. So this is, you know, sort of uh, solar system sized engineering. So it's complete science fiction at the moment. And it's just a sort of interesting thing to think about. So the question is, could you harvest energy from a black hole using a Dyson sphere? Um, I would say probably not, because the difficult thing about a black hole is that they don't emit any significant amounts of radiation other than the very sort of low levels of what's called Hawking radiation, which is very, very tiny. You know, black holes have very, very low temperatures. They're very, very cold. So they don't emit much energy. Whereas the good thing about a, a star is that a star of course has lots of energy that's shot out that you can harvest. This is how solar panel works on the earth. You know, our sun produces an enormous amount of energy for us to harvest. Black holes emit very little uh, heat and radiation. But yeah, a, a Dyson sphere around a black hole is a cool thought, but I don't think it'll be very useful for, for energy generation. Good Why question though. Uh, what happens to matter when it enters the black hole? Does it just like remain existing in it or does it like eventually disappear? Yeah, so it depends who you ask. Because for person B from this diagram we drew before, the matter never enters. It just sort of gets spread along the edge of the black hole like cream cheese on a bagel or something. So it never actually enters it. Um, but if you're thinking about from the perspective of the infalling matter, then we really have no idea what goes on once you get inside the black hole. 
uh, because we don't have this higher theory, this theory of quantum gravity that lets us understand what happens when something enters within the black hole. Okay, so yeah, it's a good question, but the answer is we don't really know. All right, Mr. Clemenson, I think it's time for us to digress. I think, do you have a science question, Rowan? Or, oh, you have a science question. All right, ask him a science question. How do you know what person A is? Here? How do we know what, sorry? How do you know what person A is here? How do we know what they're seeing? Yeah, so we know what they're seeing as they approach the edge of the black hole. So that's when they're, they're not yet quite crossing over into the black hole. So they're still in the kind of region where we know roughly what's going on. Um, once they get into the black hole, things get more difficult. So the question about how do we know any of this is true is a really good one. Uh, because of course, we've never been to a black hole. We've never done an experiment on a black hole. So, you know, I could just be talking complete rubbish. But we have good reason to think that, that these predictions that we have are accurate. So these predictions are based on Einstein's theory of relativity. So Einstein's theory of general relativity is how Einstein describes gravity. And um, we've tested this theory in many other ways. So in looking at, it makes some pretty unique predictions about the orbit of Mercury and about how light bends around stars that cannot be explained by any other theory we have. So we sort of take ev the evidence we have for Einstein's theory to be true, and then we extend Einstein's theory. We follow through the consequences of it to think about black holes, and we therefore have good reason to believe these predictions about black holes, because Einstein was right about lots of other things in this theory. It makes us think his theory is probably right for black holes as well. But that's a great question. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So it's like from person B, the matter seems like it's spreading across the black hole. Shouldn't like the black hole be easily visible? Sorry, could you say that one more time? So if, if person B sees the matter spreading like the cream cheese on the bagel, hmm. then uh, shouldn't it be easily visible? Shouldn't we easily be able to see these? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. So the, the, the per, so not only does person uh, A get spread on the black hole, I've also, I've also drawn him in red for a reason, that his color starts to turn redder and redder. So you may have heard of the Doppler effect. You know, if you hear a, an ambulance go past you when it's coming towards you, it's like, high pitched and then when it's going away, it goes lower pitched again. So it's like as it goes past you. Well, there's a similar version for light where if something is moving very quickly towards you, it appears to look bluer. And if it's moving quickly away from you, it appears to look redder. It gets stretched out the wavelength of the light and gravity has a similar effect. So the, the light from this person would eventually disappear as they get closer to the horizon, okay? 